so I actually changed the name of the presentation. It's now you are in sales, um, not as Eli described, which it, it's sort of the same stuff, but I just, I don't know, I had this interesting conversation recently that I'm going to tell you about where, where someone um, told me I was in sales. And uh, yeah, so I was having coffee with a nonprofit leader, someone I'd known for a long time. And uh, we, were, we hadn't talked since I left um, Pivot and joined the uh, private sector. And um, we were sitting for coffee, and he was like, oh, how's it going? Like, having fun. That's what he asked me. Having fun? And I said, oh, yeah. You know, one of the things that's cool is I, I meet a lot of people. I'm just like out there meeting a lot of people. And he's like, well, yeah, because you're in sales. And you know when you, like someone says something to you, and you kind of stop listening? And, you're, and they keep talking, and you're just like in your head, how dare you? How dare you? I've been watching the Mindy project a lot recently, so I have this like, how dare you stuck in my head. Um, but yeah, so he said like, you're in sales, and I was like, oh, yeah. I guess I am, fucker. Um, but you know, I thought about it a little more, and I realized he was right. So like, I'm actually a peddler. So I came up, I'm a peddler. I pedal something. It's a very wonderful software package called Nation Builder. You might want to check it out. Um, it's probably the best that's ever been built. Um, we'll kind of go through a little, like, really quick demo after this. But, um, but then I realized he's actually in sales too. And anyone who works for a nonprofit is in sales. And if you don't think you're in sales, your nonprofit's kind of screwed because you've got to get out there and you've got to meet people and you've got to talk about the thing that you're selling. And see, the thing about me is like I, got, I have this like thing that I can pull out of my pocket and it's got like email and text blasts and all these things. But nonprofits actually, have, it's way harder to sell what you're selling because it's ideas. You know, people are used to a product. They're not really used to changing the world or changing the way they um, put their kids in school or whatever it is, all the things that you guys are out there selling. Um, and so I kind of was like, I got over the how dare you, and I was like, no, it's good. I'm going to like build a story off this. This is the first time I'm, I'm trying this bit. And, um, uh, but, but it really spoke to me. So before we get started on the story that is um, the one that Eli introduced me with, I wanted to do a couple exercises. So the first thing I'd love is everyone to stand up. That was like a that was like a grade three um, band. Um, okay, so like shake it up, come on, shake it up. Like, yeah, lift up your arms, move around, those humans, bipeds. Um, all right. So here's the thing. So when I was the ED of Pivot. Um, which is a great organization. I hope many of you gave donations to it. Although I tried and then I abandoned the donation. Um, I'll do it later. You should too. Um, when I was at of Pivot, I spent a lot of time in the office. You know, as Eli was saying, I was doing this like cultural restructuring, which we'll talk about. Um, but I wasn't out in the world a lot. I wasn't like meeting new people. And I've come after working at Nation Builder for a year to realize that that is a key thing to successful nonprofits. So what I'd love to do right now is anyone who has had less than five conversations with new people this week, sit down. Anyone who's had less than five conversations with new people, people you did not know, talking about your nonprofit, not just about like what you did, you know, your yoga class or whatever. <laughs> talking about your nonprofit. Okay, let's sit down if you've had less than ten conversations. So like generally, I would have had less than two, so you're all better than me, mostly. But if you look around the room right now, these people standing up, these are your super characters. These are the people that are out in the world talking to people. Yeah, give it up. <laughs> talking to people about your nonprofit. And here's the, here's the sad part, can you sit down? Or you can keep standing if you want to just keep laughing. Um, this bothering me. In my pocket. Um, <laughs> The thing is, here's the, here's the sad lesson. Um, if you're not talking about your nonprofit out in the world, it's going to die. Your nonprofit is like not going to survive. 
And you would. This is the part of the, the speech where I like always seem like a bit of an angle, but I actually think that's a good thing. Mm. If you're not if you're not out there in the world talking about your nonprofit to people and it and it disappears, well you're kind of you're clearing up some clutter in the field. But we don't want your nonprofit to disappear. So go out there and talk to people. That that is the thing. We're all in sales. I'm open to opinions on this. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm a peddler. I peddle this software package you may have heard of. And so one thing I love for people to try, and I'm not going to do any, this, this is like, this is going to collect information, but I'm not going to do anything with it. I just want to show you the power of this software because one of the things like I wish, I sometimes have this dream that I could like go back in time and be the ED of Pivot again. And when we do these events, that we could engage text messaging. Anyone who's like spent any time with me recently, there's some people on this side of the table, they know that I'm like on about text messaging. I recently wrote a blog about it. So why don't we give this a try? If everyone could like text that, that with the hashtag to that number, pull out your cellular devices and give it a try. Can everyone see that? It's mine. But it's not my phone. Don't worry, I won't spam you or anything like that. I mean, it's just this is a demonstration list. But I will have your contact information. <laughs> so I always, I always think about this. I was recently in Toronto and a union leader came up to me and he's like, man, the text messaging with Nation Builder is amazing. I, I totally got rid of sign up sheets. We don't use sign up sheets. And I was like, oh, really? Tell me about that. He's like, on picket lines, we don't use sign up sheets anymore. We actually just have a text number that people can text into, and then we know who was at the picket line. I'm thinking about nonprofit stuff. So I was at a gala recently, an uh, amazing gala, the CCPA gala, uh, 900 people, amazing Indian food. If you haven't been to the Center for Policy Alternatives gala, you should go next year. Um, they had 900 people there. But the weird thing was, I brought a friend. And when I went up to the registration table, they were like, they're like, oh, Peter Rich for two. I was like, yeah, totally. My friend just walked in. They have no idea that he was there. And the thing is, is that they spent so much effort on that gala. And people left so inspired. But I would bet that they have less than 50% of people's emails and phone numbers. And I, I was thinking, man, if I got a text right now, as like Seth Klein was speaking, that said, hey, you like what he's saying? Donate to the CCI, I would. But, you know, they don't have my, they don't have my friend's cell phone number. Anyways, that's kind of text messaging, and, and I, I just think about like as you're all peddlers like me, because we're all like peddling our things. Think about those spaces that you're in where people are already super jazzed to be there. They're excited. You're inspiring them. Every gala you do, every like event you do, in my opinion, should to be inspire your base. Your base is already out there. Get their cell phone numbers. Figure out new ways to connect with them and ask them to do what, you, what it is you need them to do. So, um, I spent a lot of time looking at pictures like this when I was in my 20s. That's basically what I did in my 20s. Um, it's a great, like, it's a great, like when someone says to you, oh, what are you study? And you're like, yeah, I studied Soviet history. And they're like, oh, no jokes. No jokes. Like, it's a great party story. It is not good on the resume. Um, so when I uh, when I finished doing this, I I was away from Vancouver for about ten years. Came back and I was like, well, what am I going to do with my life? Um, I know about this. Um, started writing these cover letters that had a lot of pictures of Stalin in them, like reading like spud food delivery to Stalin. Yeah, I didn't get any callbacks. Um, so then I heard about this organization called Favorite Legal Society, and I started volunteering. And I became a comms, uh, first I was an operations guy, then I was comms and fundraising, and then in 2000, um, 2010, this is actually me in 2009, but in 2010, the executive director of Pivot decided that he was going to leave, and he asked me if I wanted to take over the organization. <laughs> um, 
That's what I, yeah. No, no, I don't actually. I'm totally terrified. But the thing was is that I, um, the real reason I took it over is because I was scared if I didn't do it, no one would do it, and then like I wouldn't have a job. I mean, the social mission, all those things were all nonprofit people. Like I believed in the social mission, but I was also like, man, if I don't do this, no one's going to do it. But as you can see, I uh, well, knew a lot about Stalin and Stalinist history. Um, looked like that. Um, but I was following from this guy. And so I felt like, you know, if he can do this, maybe I could do it. But one of the challenges of following from an amazing person like John Richardson, um, who makes like photos like these, his Facebook profile, um, he was this amazing leader, uh, an amazing visionary, and could just, and created Pivot like literally by the force of his will. Um, and people came along. And I was like, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I'm that guy. Like, I, I don't really know what, I mean, I know a lot about comms and fundraising now, um, I know a little bit about operations, but I'm not really sure, like, I could actually, like, pull people along, inspire them, and, and, and turn pivot um, from a bit of a suffering organization, as Eli alluded to, into a successful one. And part of the reason I couldn't do that, or why I was second-guessing myself, is because I had a very strange concept of leadership. Um, this is a picture of Lenin addressing the masses. Um, in the Stalinist version of this picture, Trotsky's not there, but in this one, this is the original, he's there. Um, so I, this was my vision of leadership. I kind of thought this was a leader. This was the only type of leader. That you were um, that guy, and that you, you roused people to action. This is how you led. Um, luckily for me, and I hope that a lot of your nonprofits invest in their people and send people to wonderful places like Hollyhock. Who, who, who here has been to Hollyhock? Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, Pivot did that a lot. Pivot, and, and hopefully still does. Um, Everyone that I ever worked with had been to Art of Leadership, and I was lucky enough to go in 2008 um, with a number of people that I knew. And um, the whole point of that was to examine your own style of leadership. And for the first time, my like sort of Leninist style of, or vision of leadership, which is very similar to like everything we get from Hollywood, it's just not Lenin from those in those movies. Um, which make them not very interesting to me, but um, with, like it's sort of like the great person theory of, of leadership. Um, at Art of Leadership, I was able to define my own style of leadership, which was a lot more collaborative. And so, when I when I took over um, Pivot, it was in a rough spot. So we had a huge amount of debt. It just downsized. Um, my first job was going around to funders and asking them to forgive debt. Um, almost the same amount of debt as our operating budget. But I did, I was able to do it because I recognized that you can lead in different ways. So as my, at my first strategic retreat as Pivot CD, I put this picture on the wall. I said, this was my shot, this was my concept of leadership. And then I put this picture on the wall. And I went around and did this with every staff member, and I said, look, I'm not going to do the pivot brand or leadership for you. That's what I need you to do. But I will give you everything that I can to make sure that you can lead in the way you need to lead. You know, one of the things that drives me really nuts when I meet with nonprofits, when I meet with tons of them these days. And someone says, oh, we don't have the budget for that. We don't have the budget for a new website. We don't have the budget for professional development. My like reaction to that, my general reaction inside is like pure rage. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like commitment, like, you know. <laughs> um, but actually, I've gotten a bit more confident in what I say is actually you don't have the budget, enough, or you, you can't afford not to do that. You know, if you're not, 
if you can't spend five thousand dollars on a new website, like this is just you know some people can, but let's if you can't, um, that's great. Well, you know your nonprofit's not going to survive. But more importantly, if you can't spend money on professional development, it's very hard for a nonprofit to survive. Um, so we went from a very command and control structure, a structure that ran, like every decision ran through one or two people, to a much more collaborative structure where decision making was a lot more open. One of the things that really um, people used to complain about at Pivot was that no one knew how decisions were being made. So we just totally democratized that. We opened it all up. A lot of the ideas that I, I was implementing came from time at another Polyhawk conference called Web of Change. Yeah, very good conference. Um, because it, it marries tech and leadership. So I went to a, a training they did in 2009 called Social Tech Training. And one of the things they said is the organizations that are doing well are organizations that are internalizing the culture of the internet. Democracy, transparency, de-siloed workspaces. And so when I came back, that's what we tried to do. It took a long time, and there was a lot of resistance, even in a small organization like Pivot. Um, what we did immediately is we decentralized. I got rid of all private conversations. There's something I can't stand is like when I have a meeting with someone and then they go have a meeting with someone else and then they have a meeting with someone else. It's just such a waste of energy. But we do it all the time because we all love to believe that we like have these silos that make us, you know, I'm the head of comp, so I need to have like a discussion with my people and not with these people over here in fundraising. Um, what we did at Pivot, we recognized we did we did three things in our organization: comps, fundraising, programs. And so we had three meetings, comms, fundraising programs. Everyone came. So I used to sit in, I was the chair of the fundraising meeting, and I, there, there was always this one lawyer who I loved, and he would just sit with his arms crossed the whole time and kind of lean back during fundraising. But I forced him to come every time. And that's, you know, when I think about leadership, there's these moments. I was kind of on a few months ago about this like concept of leadership moments. And, and those are the leadership moments where you're challenged. Leadership is not fun. Someone once called me recently and they were like, you ED, and sort of upset, and it's like, oh, like, how do, I, how do I push through these like, human problems? And I was like, well, you have to be confident enough to imagine that they think the worst of you. I can't remember, I'm kind of screwing this one up. But basically, you have to imagine they think the worst of you, but confident enough to know that they never do. You know? You have to make those tough decisions. That, that's leadership. And in this change project that we went through, there were so many of those moments. And, and it wouldn't be fair to say that everyone made it. You know, the toughest job for any non, anyone really is letting go of people. Um, but if you're a nonprofit leader, director level, you got to get good at it. And that's unfortunately what I had to do. So we ended up with a structure more like this which had the ED in the center, and then all of these people communicating across um, our different teams. Someone said to me recently, um, they were like, yeah, I don't know what's so weird about EDs these days. They're not really the, they're not really the, the programmatic um, experts. And it, it bugs me. I was like, that's awesome. Like, if your ED is a programmatic expert, I personally think you're not processing trouble. I think that they need to have like a, a knowledge of what you're delivering. But what they have to be is an amazing leader and an incredible facilitator of the team so that all of the other people in your team can be amazing leaders. So as I was saying, uh, my first job was um, to go and ask all these creditors for forgiveness on loans. All of them gave us that except one. Um, and what was funny is I didn't know whether this like experiment I was running was working. So I started in 2012, or sorry, 2010. 2012, Pivot got audited um, by the CRA, um, which kind of threw a wrench in the like whole program. I wasn't sure how things were going. It sort of felt like the worst thing that could happen, um, kind of was. 
But let me tell you, if there's any CRA people in the audience, um, turn off your phones. Um, Chime your auditor. It actually works. It does work. If you really are friendly with your auditor, it really helps. If it was doing nothing wrong, it was just like years of incompetence, really, nonprofit, you know, like receipts written on the back of napkins, heavy stuff. Like, I mean, there's, there's very little diabolical stuff in the nonprofit sector because we're just like not good enough to do that kind of stuff. We're just, we're just like basically not doing great by the CRA standards. Um, but charming your auditor works. So what was interesting, at, after three years of this, in 2013 is when I really started to see um, the change. Everything we measured started to um, prove successful. Um, we were an amazing team. This is a pivot team just before I left, uh, except not Stephen Lewis, who's never an employee. Um, <laughs> staff morale was incredibly high, incredibly high. People were motivated to do tons of things to push the limits, to experiment, to try a whole bunch of new things. Volunteers, which is something Pivot has never struggled with, but we'll, like people always want to come to Pivot, but one of the things that was challenging was how do we manage them. Our volunteer, the interest in volunteering activity was skyrocketing. Um, as was money. When I took over, our operating budget had taken a major hit. I think it was about 600 grand when I left, it was a million. In four years. Um, because we were building relationships with people and everyone was leaving. You know, it was no longer just this like silo place where lawyer working on policing was just working on policing. Lawyer working on policing was working on policing, but it was also doing some fundraising. And not to mention we had two unanimous Supreme Court victories um, that have fundamentally changed Canadian society and were the biggest victories that had ever had. Um, but then, you know, um, I was starting to feel like, okay, I've done all this stuff, and I've been doing it for four years, and, and kind of, I feel like I'm on to something, but I don't know, really know how to put this out in the world. And um, that's when Nation Builder decided to open an office in Vancouver. They called me and said, hey, would you want to come down to Los Angeles and, and talk to us about possibly working with us? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. It's not really how I roll, like, going to Los Angeles, I don't know. I've been there in a while. Um, and I, so I, but I talked to my advisors. I have a group of advisors I recommended for everyone. I showed a list of personal advisors. And they were like, you should go. You should just go. Just go. They're paying for the flight. Just go. So I go. And I'm like, I walk in. I'm super cocky, hat, like shorts. Everyone, there's a few other people wearing like suits and are really nervous. Um, and I'm just like, you know, if these guys just talk to me about technology, I'm out. Like, I'm just so out of here. Um, but they didn't. They talked about their social change mission, um, what they're trying to do in the world, and trying to empower leaders. And about halfway through the day, I was like, wow, this is, this is an amazing organization. So for the last 10 months, I've been meeting uh, with nonprofits, labor, and uh, progressive political parties. And I've, I've, uh, I've gleaned a few things. And here they are. This, I, I include myself in this because I don't want to seem like so, I don't know, arrogant or something like that. Um, when I was at Pivot, I thought we were the best fucking nonprofit in the world. This is what I always said to everyone internally best, 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 best. You know what? Not unique. And a lot of nonprofits think that. I'm sure a lot of you think that. And you should, like, feel good about your nonprofit. But let me tell you, your problems are all the same. It was something I kind of thought when I worked at Pivot. I have met with 700 nonprofits since I've been working with Nation Builder. Every problem is the same. Sometimes they're a little unique, um, but generally speaking, you get nonprofits all want the same thing, and all of their problems are the same. So it's interesting that we don't know that as nonprofit leaders. Like, and then the last thing is that you're all the same. So even though I only have one minute left, probably no minutes left. We're going to revolt against Eli here for one second. Hold on, no, no. And what we're going to do, I, this is going to be complicated. This is going to be complicated, I'm telling you. But I think we can do it. Can we all stand up and somehow get into a circle around the perimeter? Let's do that. Let, oh, I hear you groaning. Let's do it, do it, do it. Come on. 
I'm looking good. Looking good. Looking good. Good. See that? That wasn't that hard. That wasn't that hard. I definitely heard groaning, and just want to say that wasn't that hard. Whoever was groaning wasn't that hard. So whenever I go to things like this at lunch, you know what I usually do? I like to sit with people I know. Right? Who does that? Hands up! Come on! I know y'all do. Um, every single one. Of you. There are a million. There are a million. There are a hundred people in this room. And they are very interesting. And you don't know every single one of them. And I implore you as nonprofit leaders, today at lunch, to just go and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. And the reason why we're in a circle is look around. Identify someone you don't know. Make eye contact. <laughs> introduce yourself to them. Tell them about your nonprofit and why it's the best working nonprofit in the world. And, and how you're going to change the world. Thank you.